Hello and welcome to the CSF monthly podcast for April 2020. Well, with the continuation of the current COVID-19 pandemic, this podcast aims to keep you up to date with the latest in the field of rheumatology in these really unprecedented times. And before saying anything else, I, I need to wish you all the very best in these challenging times. I know that we're extending our clinical care in the most difficult of circumstances, and I hope that all of you are keeping well and safe. Now today I'm going to review two papers exploring the development of IgA vasculitis as an adverse effect of tofacitinib and the long-term effectiveness of live herpes zoster vaccine in RA patients subsequently treated with tofacitinib. Now remember to access detailed summary slides of the papers discussed, just go to cytokinesigmon.com. You'll find everything that you need there, the, the slide deck, the summary, and of course access to the original literature. Now, the first paper from Ituizumi and colleagues from Japan is a report of IgA vasculitis arising as an adverse effect of the JAK inhibitor tofacitinib. And this is the first report of this event, and that's why we thought it would be of interest to you. Now, nephrotoxicity is a key side effect of non-steroidal drugs and DMARDs used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, Non-steroidals, for example, can cause tubular interstitial nephritis, and some DMARs, methotrexate, bucilamine, penicillamine, gold, uh, lobenzerate, disodium, can cause tubular obstruction, membranous nephropathy, and interstitial nephritis with varying degrees of frequency. Now, TNF IL 6 and CD88 6 inhibitors can also cause proliferative glomerular nephritis or chrysentic glomerular nephritis. These are rare events, but they're all well described. Now, drug-induced IgA vasculitis has been previously reported for anti-TNF therapies, but this is the first time it's been reported in the context of use of a JAK inhibitor. And it's a case of a 67-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis uh, who developed IgA vasculitis after taking tofacitinib for six months. Uh, the patient was admitted to the hospital with proteinuria and purpura of the lower extremities that had developed two weeks earlier. The previous year, the patient had received methotrexate and non-steroidals with no side effects, and also received prednisolone, bucilamine, uh, slazopyridine, infliximab, and golimumab in the past without side effects. Drug lymphocyte stimulation tests were all negative for tofacitinib and laudapine and pregabalin, these being medicines that the patient was taking. Uh, urinalysis revealed significant and continuous proteinuria in the order of 18.89 grams uh, creatinine 24 hour urine collection to date 8 grams of protein with hematuria, 30 to 49 red blood cells per high per field. And although levels of albumin, uh, total protein, and total cholesterol did not meet diagnostic criteria for nephrotic syndrome. Serum IgA level was 466 milligrams per demiliter. Uh, the, the normal range is 90 to 400, and that was compatible with IgA vasculitis. Upper and lower endoscopy and CT revealed no evidence of a malignant tumour. Now, skin and renal biopsy specimens from the patient were, were compatible with vasculitis and therefore tofacitinib was discontinued. Methylprednisolone pulse therapy was added on the 51st inpatient hospital day uh, due to the proteinuria and the renal biopsy results. Um, on the 61st hospital day, so that's uh, something in the order of uh, 10 days later, protein urea had reduced to less than one gram per day, and the patient was discharged on the 74th hospital day and was prescribed 30 milligrams per day of prednisolone given orally. Prednisolone was tapered off over nine months, and the patient has since remained in remission and completely recovered from the IgA vasculitis. Now, this is a, an interesting case. The mechanism by which TNF inhibitors, or for that matter, tofacitinib, could cause nephritis are unknown. Uh, the negative drug lymphocyte stimulation test suggests this IgA vasculitis is not induced by an allergic mechanism. It more likely reflects the direct molecular signaling related to cytokine signaling pathways. And that's, I think, something that we need to look to in more detail in the future. It does seem to be a rare event, that said, in terms of clinical relevance. Uh, the authors suggest when administering a JAK inhibitor, a regular urinalysis should be performed in order to promptly detect the occurrence of glomerular nephritis uh, my own view would be that we should continue to adhere to the national monitoring requirements placed upon us for the use of JAK inhibitors. Clearly, we should have an index of suspicion in a patient who's developing renal impairment or high blood pressure or other relevant features. 
Now, the second paper I want to highlight looks at long-term effectiveness of live herpes vaccine in rheumatoid arthritis patients treated with tofacitinib. Um, lead author here is uh, Professor Kevin Winthrop and his colleagues working at the Oregon Health and Science University, Portland in the United States. Key background elements here, well, the incidence of herpes zoster is higher in people with rheumatoid arthritis compared with the general population, and it may be further increased in uh, frequency by disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Now, the ACR guidelines conditionally recommend that patients with rheumatoid arthritis aged more than or equal to 50 years should receive the herpes zoster vaccine prior to Tocsniff or uh, a biologic DMARD administration. And real-world data indicate herpes zoster instances around twofold higher with tofacitinib than with the biologic DMARs themselves. Now, this analysis focuses on a selection of patients administered with the live zoster vaccine prior to treatment with tofacitinib or placebo with background conventional synthetic DMARs. Uh, the groups had similar uh, VZV-specific immune responses, and overall immune responses were comparable with healthy volunteers in previous studies. Patients received either tofacitinib 5 mg BID or 10 mg BID in addition to any background uh, CSD MARDs. Incidence rates, 95% confidence interval rates for the herpes zoster post-vaccination were calculated based on time to first event. A short-term varicella zoster vaccine-specific immunity was evaluated at baseline and week six post-vaccination and uh, were previously reported during the index study. Key results in terms of this report, well, five herpes zoster cases occurred in the long-term extension study, uh, 218, 280, 748, 741, and 544 days post-vaccination, respectively. And all herpes zoster events were mild to moderate in severity and resolved with antiviral treatment. Cases 1, 4, and 5 had undetectable VZP cell mediated immunity at baseline and week 6. Cases 2 and 3 responded adequately to vaccination by both IgG and early spot measures, but had lower than average VZP IgG levels at baseline and week 6. Now, these results suggest that uh, the LZV may not protect adequately in the long term. Uh, that's an important observation. It, it, it's really important for us to evaluate the newly approved subunit non-live vaccine in people with rheumatoid arthritis receiving uh, tofacitinib as soon as possible. So watch this space. Now, all of this content, as I mentioned already, is available in more detailed slide format in the publication section at cytokinesignaling.com. And as always, I, I thank you for your attention, especially in these really challenging clinical times I do hope that you and your family are all well and remain so. And middle of all, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Let us know what you think by leaving a review. And thanks ever so much for your attention. And I look forward to talking with you again.